seems that I might begin. Hello, welcome to everyone. It's a bit weird without the public. I just see myself, but I'll just try it. I called my lecture today Crew about its face recognition. Maybe status quo might be a more appropriate title because uh, quite a lot of things happened in the last one or two years. So I have to concentrate a lot in what happened in the last few years. But in the last few slides, we might also see in which direction this might go in the future. Let's begin a short uh, introduction how facial recognition works in general. We have two uh, different possibilities to take a picture. Usually you have a 2D picture, a, a normal photo or picture, but there's also the possibility, possibility to have 3D pictures these days. And in 2D, you have the possibility to work in different wavelengths of the spectrum. One is the optical spectrum that we usually see, we see it in the picture on the left. We can also use near infrared, that's the image in the middle. It's, that's the light which is really close to the visible red light. It's sometimes confused with heat uh, pictures, but this one is a uh, far infrared. And the picture that you see is the, the picture on the right. There are different wavelengths, uh, these have uh, different advantages and disadvantages. The visible light is quite susceptible to, to other light sources, whereas uh, for infrared has uh, much less resolution. The second thing is that I talked about is uh, 3D face recognitions or 3D photography. photography. There are different um, different methods to do it. The first thing is shown on the, on the left side. You project parallel lines onto a 3D surface. And on the contours of the face, they are not parallel anymore, they are getting curved. And based on this, it is uh, possible to, um, to compute the depth up to an accuracy of about 0.2 millimeters or centimeters. And the right one is your project uh, a little dot to the face, and depending on how the dot size uh, changes, they can compute the third dimension. There are several algorithms on how to on how to do actual face recognition. Left one is the graph matching. You see, uh, you are looking for uh, facial features which are very well recognizable. And when you turn your head, it's uh, still possible to to recognize people. And on the right side is the so-called eigenphase. There is a database of about 100 uh, basic faces, and it works kind of like a phantom image that uh, they use to search for, for people that you don't know. It's a composition of, of many basic faces, which is compu computed into one final face, usually done with uh, machine learning, where nobody actually knows what they actually do in detail. How is facial recognition used, actually? What are the use cases? You probably know um, that all mobile phones do it besides of the fingerprint recognition. This is the second widely known biometric used in mobile phones. And since Apple, Apple uh, introduced the Face ID in 3D, so you can't only use it for uh, to unlock your device. It 
can also be used to, to unlock apps, for instance, banking apps. Another big application is the electronic passport. Since the beginning of the 2000s years, we began uh, to yeah, we began to yeah. And the, the third thing is camera surveillance in general, like identifying people using cameras in the public eye. And uh, there is also the a quite new thing is uh, instead of printing out the boarding pass, you can already use face recognition to enter a plane or to casinos or etc. So yeah, if you don't want to let people that are addicted to gaming into casinos and so on, um, facial recognition is being used to verify these records. So what are the advantages or disadvantages? Obviously, a large advantage is that you don't normally need a lot of expensive additional hardware. So all mobile phones or computers these days have cameras integrated. And for just regular facial recognition in 2D in the visible spectrum, that's enough. It's contactless and it's usable over, over large distances. So the question is if that's a pro or a con. Always have to take the intention of the entity doing the facial recognition into account. And a clear disadvantage or counterpoint is the possibility for surveillance and uh, especially with the biometric approach there you don't actually have to consent to it so as opposed to a fingerprint you actually have to put your finger and put it on a sensor facial recognition can be done without you even being aware of it as soon as your face is visible so that's basically everywhere I already spoke about disadvantages depending on the principle used for recording the picture. It's very much dependent on the environmental lighting. So if the initial photo was taken with great lighting from the front, it doesn't mean that it still works when, uh, for example, the light is coming from the side. And at least until relatively short ago, the recognition rates were pretty bad when trying to match against large databases, but unfortunately that has recently changed. So I brought an example here, this is a bit scary. Unfortunately we couldn't get audio working, but this is a body cam. So like for example police in America and in, in the US carry these that they, they carry on their bodies and it makes pictures, um, video stream of faces, and then by uh, headphones or speakers, they get information that somebody is a missing person or wanted for some crime or other. So this is one of the demonstration videos by uh, Wolfcom, one of the distributors of this technology. It's not yet real-time capable, but they're working on it. This is just an example video, but you can just, uh, it's safe to assume that in a few months or a year or so, this will be publicly used. We didn't give any data on recognition rates. And that brings us to a critical point, especially if police or any kind of uh, criminal investigation authorities use this technology, you should expect the recognition accuracy to be close to 100%. Everybody that's looked into biometric um, the biometrics before should 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 know that that's not going to happen. It's not realistic. So there needs to be a clear way of how to deal with uh, misrecognitions. These guys said they sold fifteen more than fifteen hundred uh, cameras into police departments in, uh, in in many countries. And if you have a million cameras on the streets and their uh, false positive rate is just even one percent which is completely unrealistically good. There's still a lot of uh, false alerts. Ooh. I don't know if you can also see the flicker. It's uh, flickering here a bit. I'm just going to quickly say what's on the slide. So this 
is the status of facial recognition in, in Germany, how it permeated society. The first step was the Terrorism Act from 2002, also called the Otto Act after the um, the Minister of the Interior at the time, enacted after 9-11. Of course, everybody just jumped on the train wagon. And passed uh, several laws regarding uh, related to security. So in Germany, there were 21 different laws uh, affecting things like the uh, passport and personal identification laws, the foreigners' laws, and the asylum laws. And originally, it called for recording a biometric feature such as a finger or the face. And in the meantime, they just do both. And the advantage should be that you can use computer-aided identification and make the documents less susceptible to fraud. And finally, um, improving the, the exchange of information between different law enforcement agencies to prevent uh, terrorists entering the country. And of course, everybody who's worked in civil liberties should know that it never stays with, uh, with that. So, um, passports used to have side pictures or, or quarter portrait pictures, and they switched instead to a full frontal picture. So. The security is actually reduced in the case of manual check, because for, for manual verification, the shape of the ears is actually very important. So in the past, they, the, peop, the, the border control agents could check the shape of the ears, and now that you have a frontal picture, that is uh, not possible anymore. So if the chip in the passport or ID card doesn't work anymore, security uh, safety is actually reduced and the identification quality goes down. Short note on if the chip isn't working, the document is still valid in Germany even if the chip doesn't work. Do with that information now what you will. Another important step in facial recognition in Germany was an experiment on the central train station in Mainz in 2007, sorry, um, 2002, so shortly after the Terrorism Act, the BSI, the, the Information Security Agency of the German government, started a study, the first one that actually tested facial recognition at scale, and uh, recognition rates were about 40% back then. There is a funny part of the report that we got uh, back then, and uh, it was quite amusing. One was there is a high rate of false positives with people that wear thick rimmed glasses, which makes no sense, of course, so the algorithms that try to focus on facial features. These kinds of uh, thick glasses are, of course, very um, high contrast, so very important features, which means there was a lot of false positives for people that uh, wore these kinds of glasses. So 2007, then, uh, Central Station, Mainz, the recognition rate was a little bit better, approximately 60%. In bad lighting conditions, in the evening, especially and during twilight, uh, during sunset, the recognition rates went down to about 20%, so still not really good. Then the latest field test was in Berlin, Südkreuz Station, not so long ago, about 2018. Also, recognition rates were questionable between 31 and 68 percent. Three different systems were tested. They tried all kinds of weird tricks, like uh, putting systems to each other in different configurations and claim recognition rates of 84 percent, which is still not really useful. It's actually even worse, but we're going to get to that. One hint for the second phase. They, uh, they, they changed. For the first phase, they, they took high-resolution images. For the second phase, 
they said, oh, the, the recognition rates are too bad. So they actually took the same kinds of photos that the surveillance cameras would normally use. Um, they used that as a reference image. And of course, that boosted their recognition rates artificially. But of course, it's not something that you can actually do in reality. So uh, it only matches on this specific station. And if you want to try to boot it in a different station, then your recognition rates would uh, crash out again. The recognition rate is still about um, what was it? About 85 percent, which is still about 15 percent false positives. These are quite a lot of people. If you have uh, 10,000 or 100,000 of people, so what uh, you can imagine what happens if actually some people who resemble somebody who is being searched for was being wanted. On the right side, you see uh, another story to the picture on the right side. The second picture from above is a person who was, particip who was participating in this uh, trial and she was asserted that uh, not even the federal police may see this uh, these images and uh, yeah it was shown like this on uh, television so yeah but uh, unfortunately this person is not just somebody but uh, somebody who does documentaries who did documentaries about the rights on the own picture and now he is preparing a trial <laughs> about data analysis. Unfortunately, we don't have any raw data. Um, so everything you see here is based on um, on uh, diagrams or graphs that can be shown in the final report. On the left side, I, uh, yeah, the, we have three different colors for the three different systems which were used. What you see at first glance, usually all systems should more or less uh, deliver about the same results, but this is not the case here. We see that one system has uh, no result at all or in one day, which is very questionable. On the right side, the, the, the two arrows that I marked there, is that if you usually have a recognition rate of, let's say, 80% for the blue ones, on one day we only had about 20%. Um, so if I were the manufacturer, I would really have to think think about it, how, how could some such a thing happen. But even worse is that uh, they left parts of the results away. So for uh, about three months, they recorded data, but for the for the final report, they only took data from about four weeks, or respectively four single week, four single weeks, but not consecutive. And they did not even take the entire week. So it, it can be assumed that the false positive rate has been uh, has been much worse than it is can be seen in the report. Some more numbers. What of the status quo of uh, facial recognitions in Germany? There's a central database with 5.8 million. Uh, pictures of faces, and there were about 24 uh, inquiries to the federal German, German Federal Criminal Police. And the police had uh, used, used it about 1,200 times and identified 219 people. In Bavaria, this is already in operation since more than 12 years. The state criminal police of Bavaria has supposedly identified 
387 people based on this. But we have the problem that the facial recognition is a quite an impact on the personal rights. So the, the it should be more yeah, it should be less easy for a state to do this than Bavaria can just do it. To something more recent, the more recent topic, it's Corona. But uh, yeah, also we have some. In this picture, we see problems of facial recognition. These days, quite a lot of people are wearing masks, and the facial recognition doesn't work anymore. It's clear a major part of the face is, uh, is covered by the mask, so some people had the idea to print masks with their own face or some other face, so it's still possible to unlock their own phone with or, or similar things. This want to work with the iPhone, it only works with the phones which are working with 2D images. There are some companies which tried to equalize it. They lowered, they lowered the range which, which is used for facial recognition. So they only use the eye part of the face anymore. But it's clear that the recognition rate cannot, cannot get better when such an important part of the face is just missing. A scary example of facial recognition and corona comes from Russia. We have, uh, they have social monitoring, a social monitoring in app in Russia, but they are more advanced than in Germany. It stores biometrics, supposedly only in the app, but they, there were cases where people left their phones at home and were recognized by public surveillance cameras, so they're Apparently, is somewhere a database of people who have COVID-19, and the surveillance cam in Moscow. They check images from this database. If there is a match, you will you will get uh, delivered into quarantine by force, which I thought is quite scary, so I won't um, advance into this topic anymore. Another example from China, um, facial recognition, how it should not work. The story behind it is that in China, there is a, some kind of, there is a social scoring. And there's done quite a lot with using facial recognition to do automatic scores, etc. And in this case, we have uh, usually when people cross, for instance, a red light, then the system does automatic facial record recognition and shows it on a big screen, like, hey, for, for public shaming. The problem here is that a Chinese businesswoman had, so her company did a big advertisement on the side of a bus. Of course, this bus always crossed when the pedestrians had a red light. And so the social scoring always thought that this uh, businesswoman always crossed the Cross the red light on the street, which is not good. Let's come to the to a like a shitty topic, which I tried to to yeah I, I did I did this slide in the last few days, but I. It wasn't that motivated because it's not a nice topic to talk about. What did Clearview do? What did this company do? This company collected quite a 
uh, yeah, collected images from several image sources like Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and they offered their they offered to make uh, matches against their database. And in the beginning of 2020, a database was leaked with at least 2,200 uh, customers or pe yeah, pe customers within. And we saw that uh, quite a lot of countries, also the Interpol or immigration offices, etc., were within the customers customer database of this uh, company Clearview. So there are also customers there where you might think, well, they don't actually have have the right to spy behind me, but yes, they actually did it. The CEO of uh, Clearview said that uh, uh, unfortunately data breaches are a part of life in the 21st century and I find that this is not the right attitude for a company working with uh, such sensitive data such as faces of people. So, there was one article I couldn't find anymore that connected the founder of the company to the alt-right movement, so uh, neo-Nazis. And one of the ideas why they founded that company is that they wanted to use facial recognition to to mass deport uh, so-called illegal, illegalized immigrants in the US. And yeah, that's why I just couldn't anymore. But there's also a uh, more positive example, or rather an example uh, how you can use this for good. And that is a project that the uh, Center for Political Beauty used in December 2019. There was this one case uh, of a murder in Chemnitz. And a mass demonstration by a bunch of fascists in Chemnitz. And the Center for Political Beauty then created a uh, website where you can search for yourself, or rather where you can search for uh, your, your, your friends, your acquaintances, to see if they were spot on this uh, protest. It worked pretty well. I had a chance to look at the uh, software running that and was surprised how well it worked. So there were images by, by uh, Chancellor Merkel on a uh, poster that the Nazis were carrying, and I just put a, an image of Merkel into there and it was recognized. And at first time where I thought, oh shit, this is the point where facial recognition has reached a point where it's actually useful with um, data at scale. Just to get some more information, what they did, they took photos from this uh, protest and a video where all these Nazis are passing by an apartment where somebody had a camera running. And then they check to see how many people they can identify from fa uh, famous Nazis. Here's one example. They found uh, Höcke several times with some really good recognition rates. And this is where, up until now, I said trying to do facial recognition on large groups with bad lighting conditions doesn't work. But now you actually have to say, it is different now, it's changed now. But I also want to say some more positive things, more encouraging things. 
because uh, I'm also looking into how we can uh, work around these kinds of systems. Most of the systems are still pretty easy to get around. So including modern smartphones, facial recognition, you can just use a, a photo, uh, hold it in front, take a photo with phone and put the display in front of the camera and so on. That still works. Of course, the manufacturers also know that. And they try to put liveness detection, for example, by looking for uh, motion. So uh, motion detection to verify that subject is actually alive. So then it's not enough to use a photo, but you can still play a video sequence, for example. If you don't want to do that, there's another funny uh, trick. It's a software that does facial recognition. And that uses uh, blinking for liveness detection. So this is an ex-colleague of mine. First to show how it works. You can see there in the corner the, the blue eye icon. That said, now please blink. And then he did. And then that confirmed the, uh, it unlocked the computer. So we wanted to see if we can just uh, trick it. So we printed his photo, this is a printout of his face, and he saw the icon, it says please blink, and instead of blinking we just took a pencil, just waved it in front of the photo, and it unlocked. So the background is that the liveness detection works by looking at, oh, are there black pixels for the pupil? And are they going away for a short time while you're blinking? And this pen is close enough to uh, skin coloring. So the algorithm thinks that the photo, the, the person closed their eyes. There's another method, for example, MasterCard uses a similar method that goes beyond just uh, blinking. So they're using gestures uh, and facial gestures in uh, to identify people, for example, um, looking sad or, or smiling. And there's a funny idea here, there's a, a video from a US university, so they filmed the face of a person, and then they put it as an overlay over the original image, and then they can make the target say anything or smile or do any kind of facial uh, gesture. For three-dimensional things that doesn't work, of course, there's also ways to, uh, to fake that. Uh, 3D printers is one that is very uh, obvious, so you have to somehow get a uh, 3D scan of the face. But there's also software that if you have multiple photos taken from different angles, uh, that can calculate a 3D model uh, using photogrammetry, and then you can print that. And then you can create a mask, as you can see here on the on the right side. And for simple systems, that works very well. Another funny thing I already mentioned earlier that nowadays most facial recognition software is using machine learning. And an American university, the Carnegie Mellon University, has looked into how you can confuse these machine learning algorithms. So in the uh, upper row, you see uh, classes that they, that they built, that they printed in different colors. And these patterns of, of uh, colors fool the, the algorithm so much that instead of recognizing the original person's face, it is recognized the uh, famous people that you can see in the lower row, no matter uh, which, uh, which gender. So if you think, okay, if it's so easy to confuse these systems, then it's even more questionable if they should be used or not. What are the possibilities to flee the facial recognition? A good example gives the table which explains how to do um, 
a, a, passport, a passport picture in these days. And everything which has a red cross means that you should not do it because it lowers the recognition rate. So if you don't want to get um, recognized, do the things which are crossed on the, these on these uh, images. For instance, turn your head or uh, cover certain parts of your face, have hair before of your face. A study in a study said that when you turn your face more than 15 degrees, they, the recognition rate is significantly decreased. Uh, some guy from Japan had a funny idea too. He added some infrared LEDs in uh, uh, normal in his normal glasses, and it's not visible to the human eye. To the human eye, but the camera is being blinded such that it cannot do an actual picture. I did some more tests it, uh, with uh, using a Samsung Galaxy S8, and I tried out how much I could do uh, until I'm not recognized anymore. So you see simple things like um, having some uh, wearing a hoodie or having some hair in your face uh, already makes the system quite less robust. Or you can wear glasses, sunglasses, you can wear masks, you can do tattoos or uh, face makeup, special kind of makeup, which use special pattern that you paint on your faces and they can uh, yeah, they, they are enough. Yeah, it, it's even for a human difficult to recognize such a face, so it, the algorithms are getting in, into trouble even more. So now the last slide, I will after that start to the Q&A. So there is a dilemma. We have uh, we are somewhere between total survi surveillance, but there is still a high false positive rate. I always said that that uh, facial recognition. I always thought that facial recognition is not um, good enough to make mass surveillance, but I have learned something better in the last year. It became quite quite better. Unfortunately, these systems work, and it's time now. It's now time to act. It's now time to get active, and we need to to have laws which says, for example, it's not allowed to use facial recognition in public areas. This is already be done. For instance, in California and here in Germany, we are still discussing if this might not uh, be a good idea at train stations or so. And yeah, that was my last slide. I will try to do the Q&A now. So let's see if we have a connection and if there are any questions. Unfortunately, I have uh, quite a bad audio quality now, so I cannot really translate what they are saying. I don't understand anything here in the translation booth. So I'm I'm sorry, we have uh, technical difficulties here. I don't hear the audio, it's very choppy. So unfortunately, I cannot translate the Q&A. Maybe it gets better in a while, we, we still wait. If you have other feedback to our, to our translations, you can give it uh, you can give it on uh, Twitter or Mastodon under the hashtag C3T. 
or under the hash C3Lingo on Rocket Chat. Our website is c3lingo.org. I will now try to search for the pad, so I might maybe at least translate the questions. We still have bad audio quality in the translation booth. It, I guess it won't get any better, so I'm sorry there is no translation at the moment uh, because we don't understand the original audio. I'm really sorry for that. Have a look at the pad, read the questions yourself and maybe ask somebody from the original stream who might have understood it. So the iris or contact lenses might be one idea to improve facial recognition by using multimodal systems. So, in addition to facial recognition, you could add iris recognition because cameras are already prepared for that. At least if you look at modern smartphones, the front-facing cameras, selfie cameras, have a resolution that's high enough iris recognition. And you don't actually need a very good resolution for virus recognition. So I think we will see systems that combine that face recognition with iris recognition in the not so far future. Okay, then there's one question. In Asia, the, uh, the face is used in some parts as a public transport ticket. Is there something similar planned for Germany? No, so the, the Mainz uh, station was a field test by uh, BSI and the Ministry of the Interior in Germany. So it's it's not at all about actually using it or, or replacing tickets, uh, transit tickets. It's really just about testing different systems as surveillance systems to uh, find wanted criminals, for example, uh, to test those scale. And in Germany, I think there would be legal ramifications. So from, from a privacy point of view, it would be highly problematic to use a facial recognition for that because anything that, that impacts your basic uh, legal rights less has to be used before any other options. So especially facial recognition, any kind of biometric measurements are very, very personal. It's a very personal feature that is that is unique to your to your person that describes your person. So if you can somehow avoid using that, then uh, you should. And I think that is still a uh, consensus for most people. There's still um, some tests going on. Um, the zoo in Hanover, I think, in Hanover, I think, used uh, fingerprints. There was a uh, swimming pool that, that tested that, and then either very quickly they they realized it doesn't work or the people don't use it or the uh, data privacy protection officers actually come by and say well uh, what's going on then there's a question about the false positive rate or generally uh, numbers about accuracy yeah so i realized earlier that i uh, that a little bit or rather i didn't actually show that uh, slide I just need to um, turn on the slide scene. Okay, so false positives, false negatives. Let's look at this 
these data points. Okay, let's use let's use these. So before I only talked about the 80% recognition rate, and of course you can't look at that in isolation, but the recognition rate is always tied to the uh, false positives rate. So I'm going to explain it on this uh, diagram. A false positive rate of 0.1%. So every thousand attempt of a uh, unauthorized person is actually accepted as an authorized person. And on the other hand, you have the recognition rate, the uh, actual recognition. And here in this case, for example, you take this line, go down that line. And in this configuration, this uh, threshold, if you want 0.1% wrong positives, then you have a recognition rate of 97%. So three out of every hundred people are rejected by the system. Okay, final question. How likely is it that Google or Apple give out facial recognition to have improved recognition rates? Um, improve recognition rates. Well, so normally the, the companies use the data themselves, at least um, Google and uh, iPhone, of course, they, they both have their own software, so they have the data. And of course, the, the aggregate data is used to improve these algorithms again. But passing them on to anyone else, they probably wouldn't, because it's also their, their proprietary and valuable um, treasure trove of data. And of course, you can't just do it without getting the consent of the um, of the people. So I would assume that they that they wouldn't do it. But with uh, photos, with photos of faces, everybody pretty much does it voluntarily anyway. So if you just search for your name or uh, search for my face, you will find uh, pictures of yourself from events that you visited. And on our Facebook or Instagram, there should be a photo somewhere that also contains your name. Or, for example, the, the name of your friend is, is tagged as label, and you can go to Twitter and so on. So you can assume that your face is uh, already there somewhere on the internet with your name. If not there, then it's at least with the official authorities. If you ever got yourself an ID card or a passport, the, uh, the, the uh, German federal, uh, federal Criminal Agency has access to this data. The Secret Services have access anyway. So you might as well assume that at least the authorities, uh, a large number of authorities have access to this data. Okay, thank you. And uh, I would... Say thank you for this. Yeah, thanks, thanks to you. Um, it's a it's a cool format. It's a bit weird to speak without an audience. Hope it still worked well, um, and I wish you an enjoyable event.